Greetings. My name is Andrew Isaacs. I'm on the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley, Haas School of Business, where my job is to teach climate science and climate change strategies to our business students. In this video, we'll talk about greenhouse gases, what they are, what they do that is both helpful and harmful to our environment, and where they come from. Let's begin by looking up. When you look up into the sky, what you're looking at, or through, is our atmosphere, which is 99% nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. These three gases are transparent, colorless, odorless, and in the case of nitrogen and argon, don't react with much. Needless to say, oxygen is a different story. It reacts with everything, and all animals require oxygen to survive. The other 1% of the gases in Earth's atmosphere are what we call trace gases, and are present in part per million or part per billion concentrations. Now, some of those trace gases have the unusual property that they are transparent to visible light, but are not transparent to infrared radiation, what we refer to as heat. Gases with that special property, being not entirely transparent to heat, are what we refer to as greenhouse gases, and they give rise to an effect in our atmosphere called the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is the process by which radiation from a planet's atmosphere warms the planet's surface. This warming brings the temperature above what it would be without the presence of greenhouse heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases add to the warmth of a planet's surface by trapping heat emitted from the surface and re-radiating it back down. The way greenhouse gases work is much the same as how a blanket works. The blankets you use to keep warm at night don't generate heat. They trap the heat that your body generates and re-radiates that heat back to you. Greenhouse gases do the same thing in our atmosphere. They trap heat emitted from the surface of the Earth and re-radiate it back. The effect of adding more and more greenhouse gases to our atmosphere is exactly the same as if you keep piling blankets onto someone. They will get warmer and warmer and warmer as heat gets trapped. And as we're going to see, that's exactly what we're currently doing to planet Earth. Here's a partial list of the 30 or so greenhouse gases that we humans are adding to our atmosphere. The first three gases on this list are both naturally occurring and man-made as a result of human activity, things like driving cars, fertilizing fields, and heating homes. They are also the most important, and it is these three that we will focus on in this video. All the other greenhouse gases are not naturally occurring. They are synthetic compounds, mostly fluorinated gases that we produce for use in refrigeration. This table also lists the relative warming effects of each of these gases. You'll notice that carbon dioxide is assigned a global warming potential of 1, methane a potential of 25, and nitrous oxide about 300. What that means is that molecule for molecule, Methane is about 25 times more potent a greenhouse gas than is carbon dioxide. And nitrous oxide is about 300 times more potent than is carbon dioxide. You'll notice that some of the fluorinated gases are thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide. We've known about greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect for well over 100 years. It was way back in 1896 that a Swedish chemist named Svante Arrhenius used modern principles of chemistry to demonstrate how increasing CO2 in the atmosphere would increase Earth's surface temperature. He would go on to win the Nobel Prize. Arrhenius also concluded 
that human-caused CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning could cause global warming. But we can't really say that he was ahead of his time. It's just that over the intervening century since he did his work, we haven't been really paying attention to what has been completely understood for a hundred years. What would happen if we increased year on year our production and consumption of fossil fuels? Now, as we'll see, CO2 is the most important of the greenhouse gases, not because it's the most potent. In fact, it's the least potent, but because we are putting so much of it into the atmosphere. Here's a record of the accumulation of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere from the 1950s through to the present. The squiggles that you see each year are the natural seasonal cycles of plants taking in more CO2 in the summer than in the winter. But the big story here is not the squiggles each year. The big story is the continuous increase in the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere from about 300 parts per million in the 1950s to more than 400 parts per million today. We also have geological evidence going back much farther in time than just the 1950s. Here's a chart of CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere going back 10,000 years. I've added a horizontal red line to make it easy to see that there have not been major fluctuations in the concentration of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere over the past 10,000 years until the 20th century. Now, 10,000 years covers the entire emergence of human civilization. So it's more than fair to say that human civilization has come into existence during a period of climatic stability, a period called the Holocene. Today's climate is, and is going to continue to be, so different that we no longer call the current period the Holocene, but rather the Anthropocene. This new era of modern climate change is the result of our decision as a society to add substantially to the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere. It's just as if we made a decision to keep piling on the blankets to warm things up more and more and more. Now, where is all the carbon dioxide accumulating in our atmosphere coming from? Well, this simple chemical equation pretty much answers that question entirely. This reaction shows the combustion of methane, or natural gas if you prefer, with water and carbon dioxide being the two waste gases that come from that combustion. Any fossil hydrocarbon, coal, oil, or natural gas that we take out of the ground and burn results in the same thing. What we're doing is taking carbon in the form of hydrocarbon molecules out of the ground, setting fire to them, and releasing water and CO2 into the atmosphere. The water we don't care too much about because it comes out as rain. The CO2, though, has a lifetime in the atmosphere of essentially forever. It does not break down or leave the system somehow and permanently go back into the Earth. The CO2 released from a trip to the supermarket today in a gasoline-powered car will stay in the atmosphere, in effect, for thousands of years still warming the planet long after we're gone. This chart shows very clearly what we're doing. This is global CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion. The vertical axis is billions of tons of CO2, and the horizontal axis is the period from 1900 through to the present. The red dot is CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion in the year 2022, showing recovery following the downtick of the COVID-19 pandemic. The overall trend is clear. We are now emitting nearly 40 billion tons of CO2 per year into the atmosphere by burning coal, oil, and natural gas. And most of that CO2 is staying in the atmosphere, warming the planet more or less indefinitely.
Now, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. This chart nicely shows the combined warming effect of CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases. What you'll notice is that the combined warming effect of these gases, taking into account their relative potency, has increased about 50% since 1990, meaning that in just 30 years, we have added enough greenhouse gas to the atmosphere to have increased global warming by 50%. The changes we are making to the chemistry of Earth's atmosphere are not just large in magnitude and rapid, they have also taken us into uncharted territory. The atmospheric concentration of CO2 is the highest in at least 2 million years, and possibly much longer. And the atmospheric concentration of methane and nitrous oxide are the highest in at least 800,000 years. Now it's time to ask the question, what are the human activities that are giving rise to the greenhouse gases that we are emitting into the atmosphere? And the answer is that nearly 75% come from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. That includes everything from heating buildings and homes to fueling transportation like cars, trucks, ships, and airplanes, to producing petrochemicals and steel making. And of course, burning coal and natural gas is still how we produce most of the electricity we use worldwide. The remaining roughly 25% mostly comes from agricultural practices, forestry and other land use changes, and a little bit is emissions from landfills and other sources. These percentages will vary slightly depending on how they are grouped. Yet, they all yield the same conclusion. Human activity is having an impact at scale across all sectors. Let's briefly look at these sources through the lens of which greenhouse gas is associated with which kind of activity. Here's a nice summary of the rate at which the four groups of greenhouse gases are accumulating in the atmosphere. CO2, as we already saw, has been trending up. In the lower right-hand corner are the fluorinated gases, some of which are trending up and some of which have been banned and are now trending down. Methane and nitrous oxide have been trending up. Let's look at them more closely. Here's a chart showing the increasing concentration of methane in our atmosphere. This chart shows a worrying reality. Methane has a relatively short half-life in the atmosphere of just 10 years. So the fact that methane is accumulating means that we are emitting methane faster than it is breaking down. Where are those emissions coming from? Here's a good summary of the sources of human-caused methane emissions. Approximately one-third of methane emissions are coming from leaks in oil and natural gas wells, pipelines, and distribution systems. In theory, at least, that could be driven to zero if we were willing to pay for finding and fixing those leaks. The next big source of methane is enteric fermentation, which is a fancy way of saying cows. You see, cows and some other livestock, such as goats and sheep, ferment food in their rumens before it enters their stomachs. That fermentation process results in the burping out of a lot of methane. Landfills, at 17%, are a significant source, although increased composting efforts may address some of those emissions. Manure management, as it is called here, is, well, cows again. Finally, a lot of methane is released during coal mining. Shown in this chart are human-caused fluxes of methane in blue and natural fluxes of methane in green. Natural fluxes from things like wetlands and the microbial decay of organic material are essentially offset by the breakdown of methane in the atmosphere due to the 10-year half-life I mentioned earlier. Emissions of human-caused methane from fossil fuels, 
agriculture, ranching, and landfills will break down over time. But we are adding it to the atmosphere faster than it can break down, so it continues to accumulate. The other greenhouse gas I will cover today is nitrous oxide. As we saw earlier, the concentration of this gas in the atmosphere is also increasing at a steady rate. And since nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than is CO2, this is quite alarming. Here's the nitrous oxide emissions coming from the United States, which is similar to elsewhere in the world. Roughly three quarters of human caused nitrous oxide emissions are coming from the use of fertilizer for food production. That stems from the fact that much of the nitrogen fertilizer we add to farmland does not make it into the crops we're trying to grow, but rather is broken down by microbes in the soil and released into the atmosphere as nitrous oxide. Other sources of nitrous oxide emissions are small in comparison, so we'll ignore them. Fortunately, nitrous oxide does break down naturally in the atmosphere, but unfortunately, its half-life is rather long, about 100 years. And the story for nitrous oxide is pretty similar to the story for methane. These greenhouse gases had been breaking down in the atmosphere at the same rate that they were being emitted from natural sources, with natural sinks offsetting the natural sources. But human activities, in particular the use of nitrogen fertilizer, is what is driving the increase in nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. Now, the addition of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere does more than just warm the planet. For example, about one quarter of human-caused CO2 emissions are absorbed by the oceans, and as a result have made the oceans about 30% more acidic than they were in the mid-20th century. That CO2 removal is not permanent, though. The oceans will release that CO2 back into the atmosphere if CO2 levels in the atmosphere ever decline. Another quarter of our CO2 emissions are thought to be taken in by green plants, possibly altering their growth. CO2 is, after all, one of the ingredients that plants use to grow. But since no other growth factor is changing in the same way, and plant genetics change very slowly in the natural world, it is not yet clear the degree to which plant life is adapting to higher atmospheric CO2. Suffice it to say, by adding so much greenhouse gas to the atmosphere, and doing so in such a brief period of time, we are running a grand, inadvertent experiment on our planet.